Is the will really in bondage? The defense of Calvinism traps even the best minds into hopeless contradictions. Spurgeon himself couldn't seem to make up his mind, in spite of referring to the equally sure doctrine that the will of man has its proper position in the work of salvation and is not to be ignored. Spurgeon also claimed that the idea of free will left the whole economy of grace and mercy to be the gathering together of fortuitous atoms impelled by man's own will. That, obviously, is not true. Fortuitous atoms have nothing to do with grace and mercy, nor does anyone who believes in man's power to make moral choices imagine that he can control atoms with his will. Spurgeon should have stayed with biblical exegesis. He went on to lament, We cannot tell on that theory whether God will be glorified or sin will triumph. Hardly. That we finite beings wouldn't know how something would turn out means nothing. The outcome always was known to God from eternity past. Sadly, great preacher that he was, in that sermon Spurgeon erected and destroyed one straw man after another. It must either be as God wills or as man wills. If not God, then you put man there to say, I will, or I will not. If I will it, I will enter heaven. If I will it, I will conquer the Holy Spirit. For I am stronger than God, and stronger than omnipotence. If I will it, I will make the blood of Christ of no effect. It shall be my purpose that shall make his purpose stand, or make it fall. With all respect to Spurgeon, this is nonsense. Even the rankest Armenian would never imagine that he could conquer the Holy Spirit, or that he was stronger than God, or that man's will would ever make the blood of Christ of no effect, or force an entrance into heaven. God has set the rules for entering heaven. Man either accepts or rejects the salvation God offers in Christ, but he is certainly not in charge. Like so many other Calvinists in their zeal to defend God's sovereignty to the exclusion of human will, Spurgeon stooped to twisting Scripture to his own ends. For example, he quotes Christ's indictment of the rabbis, You will not come to me that you might have life. He then declares, Where is free will after such a text as that? When Christ affirms that they will not, who dare say they will? Man is so depraved, so set on mischief, the way of salvation is so obnoxious to his pride, so hateful to his lusts, that he cannot like it, and will not like it, unless he who ordained the plan shall change his nature and subdue his will. Spurgeon misses the Lord's point. Christ is making this statement specifically to the rabbis, not to all men. Secondly, the statement itself says that they have a will, that by their own will they are rejecting him. You will not come to me, nor does Christ say that they cannot will to do otherwise. Indeed, Christ's statement would be meaningless unless they could of their own will repent and come to him. Only two chapters later, Christ declares, if any man will do his, that is, God's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. John chapter 7, verse 17. Spurgeon himself, in the same sermon, quotes this scripture as proof that man's will has a part to play in man's coming to Christ. Is the will really in bondage? If so, to what or to whom? And... Is it possible to set the captive will free from its bondage? If so, how can this be done? We must consider those questions carefully, and we will do so in the context of a further examination of Luther's treatise.